prelude? Come here. It was her. <laughs> Did y'all, like, woohoo! Go, girl, take a bow. You might as well get used to taking bows now. It's so good to see all of you, see all of you coming in and all of our choir on this Memorial Day. Um, we're going to honor our, our veterans, um, those who are, are fallen and who lost their life to serve this country in just a little bit. But I did want to take a moment today. It is Memorial Day. Um, and it is the day that we remember all of those who fought and gave up their life so that we could have this time to be right here in worship. That's kind of a big deal, wouldn't you agree? It's kind of a big deal. So hold that in your heart as we move forward with our worship service and as we move into tomorrow, um, as we have our cookouts and our celebrations to remember why we are having our cookouts and celebrations. So I wanted to, to bring that to your attention. Um, but as far as turning to worship, I've been, um, we've been talking a lot about worship and I, I, I wanna share a quote with you this morning, and it's a quote by Elizabeth Elliot. Does anybody know who Elizabeth Elliot is in here? Yeah. Um, um, she was a Christian author, a speaker. Her first husband, his name is Jim Elliot. He was killed in 1956 while attempting to make missionary contact with the Akua in eastern Ecuador. And this is what is so cool to me. It didn't matter how much she wrote or what, how much she taught as a professor. The coolest thing for me about her life, the most profound thing for me about her life is after that tribe killed her husband, she spent two additional years as a missionary with them, teaching them about Jesus. Whew, that's pretty cool, isn't it? This is what she writes. She says, very often, parenthesis, nearly always, comma, I'm afraid, parenthesis. Nearly, very, or she says, very often, when I come to church, my feelings are utmost in my mind. This is natural. We are human. We are selves. And it takes no effort at all to feel. But worship is not a feeling. Worship is not an experience. Worship is an act. And this takes discipline. 
We are to worship in spirit and in truth. Never mind about the feelings. We are to worship in spite of them. I'm going to read that one again. We are to worship in spirit and in truth. Never mind about the feelings. We are to worship in spite of them. She goes on to say that finding myself scattered, I can relate. Finding myself scattered in all directions and in need of corralling like so many skittish calves, I kneel before the service begins and ask to be delivered from a vague preoccupation with myself and my own concerns and to be turned during this short hour to God. That's some powerful words, isn't it? That's what I invite us to do today. It's to let go of me, my, I, and turn. Let God turn you to himself so that you can worship truly and fully. I have two prayer requests that I want to lift up this morning. I don't normally do that during this time of our service. Um, But I got a text from my son who said his girlfriend of 16 months is in the ER. Mama, will you do that prayer thingy? (laughs) And um, a former church member who is now in ministry with me, um, I spent right much time in Concord at the hospital yesterday and got word this morning that his organs are beginning to fail. They can't find where there's bleeding. Um, So their whole family is a mess, and I told her that we would lift Tony I'm Tony Thompson in prayer this morning as well. So if you could just kind of hold that. I know that many of you have your own prayers, and I appreciate you allowing me to share those two this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and merciful God, we are so caught up in our own feelings that we miss you. Forgive us, we pray. We don't want to prepare We don't want to be disciplined. We simply want you to hang the moon for us and give us all we want with very little effort. Forgive us, Lord. We want to show up and be fed, cling to the self, have it only my way, give little regard to your voice or your calling or your vision. Forgive us, mighty God. And despite us, We give you thanks because you still call us and you still speak to us and you still show up, pouring out your grace to us. You are there with us and for us. Thank you, Lord Most High. God, help us to worship today by once again pouring out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered those who are watching at home, pour out your spirit and break through these selfish feelings of want and disapproval and fear and worthlessness that we have. Break through all of those emotions and let us catch a glimpse behind the veil, a glimpse of the power of your presence here today. May we be ready to worship. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Another way to help us worship is by claiming what it is that we believe. And so I'm going to ask you to stand this morning as we affirm our faith. The words will be on the screen, but in case the screen messes up and you don't know it, the words are also on 881 in your hymnal. Let's join together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Let's take just a couple of moments. Let's throw a fist bump or a wave. Let's say good morning to one another for just a moment. Hey, y'all. couple of announcements with you all this morning. Don't forget, next Sunday, June the 6th, we start our Sunday lunch bunch for all the kids. All the kids in here, fifth grade, to, to potty train. <laughs> Please. I can, but I don't want to. <laughs> um, we will host you after after worship service and provide lunch. I'm so excited about that ministry. So if you've got the email this week, and you're, you, I hope you will bring your children. Just fill out those information, the information sheet for us. Um, that will be great. Also, for our children, Vacation Bible School is coming very quickly. It's July 11th through the 13th, so you'll want to sign up now. And last but not least... We still have all of our high school seniors, their pictures are out on that table, and in front of their picture is a book that we are giving them. Not everyone has had a chance to sign it, but that is for you to sign words of encouragement or, or whatever you want so they can take that with them. I cannot tell you the importance of signing that book, like what that will mean. They're going to put it on the shelf. It's going to collect dust until their dire moment. And they're going to have a dire moment, and they're going to see that book. And they're going to pull that book out, and they're going to read what you have written to them, and it might get them through. So I hope that you will do that. It's so special and so important, so I wanted to remind you of that. I also want to um, just, I'm going to share a story with you. Um, the offering plates, I mean, the offering baskets are at the doors. Remember, we came in this way. You'll go out that way. You can put your offering in the basket if you brought it with you today. You can give your offering online through your bank account, the church website, however it is that I want that you want to give your offering. But I'm going to leave you with one story um, that I think speaks volumes. So I have firsthand knowledge of someone who's working in a restaurant, and um, a table of ten made reservations to come to said restaurant. It was a little slow because the kitchen help was a little messed up, had somebody out, and 10 people were very demanding, and 10 people wanted this, and 10 people wanted that, and the waitress ran around and ran around and ran around and helped serve those 10 people so they would have a good experience for their graduation lunch. A bill of over $150, they left $6 in the tip. <laughs> Do I really need to say anything else? Yeah. Kind of does it, but.
Okay, we need all the little children to come down front. All the little youngins. Hello. Okay, we're going to come over here today. we got all kind of stuff up here. Is that everybody? <laughs> okay. Come have a seat. And I'll bring you some more. How's everybody? I'm glad to see you today. So, I don't know if you heard Pastor Andy when we first came in, but she was talking about this weekend is a special weekend. It's a holiday weekend, and you see lots of flags everywhere. My grandsons got here the other day, and they had flags on the outside of their car. I thought the president was coming in my neighborhood. <laughs> what's this week, what's this holiday called? Memorial Day. Good for you, Memorial Day, yes. And that is where we remember all the people for all the years and years and years that lost their life, they gave their life fighting for our country so we have all the rights and privileges that we do. And we're very blessed because you know what? Where are we? Earth. Yeah, we're on Earth. But <laughs> we are the United States of America. What is this building? A church. We get to go to any church we want to, and we get to worship God, and we get to talk about Jesus, and we get to tell our friends about Jesus, and we get to take communion, and we get to invite our friends to church, right? There are some people that live places that don't have, aren't blessed like that like we are. So, everybody's going to get a flag. There is a song that we sing and it's called America. Do you know that song? Do you know My Country Tis of Thee? Who came to preschool? You did. You learned it in preschool. We learned it here. You did. Yeah. So when you start singing it, you'll know. You'll know it. So you're going to stand up and you're going to wave your flag and everybody in here is going to sing My Country Tis of Thee. Okay? If you would like to. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Davis is going to give everybody a flag. Stay standing. All right, and we're going to sing, Lord, I need you.
morning. Mark is, um, okay. There's feedback everywhere. John, could you help? Okay, you got it? Whew, okay. Hey, Mark. I know he said he was watching this morning. I wanted to say a hello to him. I'm still a little hot there, Chuck. It's still, there's, I don't know where it's coming from. There's feedback everywhere up here. Okay. Oh, my goodness. So we have been doing this series at the table, and the best table is the table for today. It is the communion table. It is the best part of sitting at a table. Communion is a sacrament. And we talk about sacraments and what is a sacrament. A sacrament is something that is believed to have been ordained by Christ that is held to be a means of divine grace or to be a sign or a symbol of, of, of a spiritual reality. Um, it's that means of grace. It's the way in which Jesus Christ reaches us, speaks to us, talks to us, gives us um, forgiveness and, and all of those things. The communion or this sacramental table is the place that we can find healing where hearts can be mended or the ability to actually forgive someone can come through this sacramental table. The ability to forgive ourselves can come at this sacramental table. There's this power that comes. There's this power that is present at this table. We've seen over the course of the last few weeks how there is power in the table. Remember, we talked about that first week. We talked about... Um, you know, friends and family and strangers and how we invite them to our, our table. You'll hear more about that in a minute. But this power that's in this table shouldn't be taken lightly. Now, I love the United Methodist Church because all are welcome. Whether you're a member of this church, whether you're visiting this church, if you are here, you are seeking something from God, whether you even realize it. Children can come and partake at this table, but there is still power here. There's still something that can happen. Paul knew about the power of the communion table, but I think the people in the church had forgotten about the power of the communion table. So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 28. I'm reading from the message version of the Bible this morning. And it says this, regarding this next item, I'm not pleased at all. So Paul's been writing them and, and talking to them. Regarding this next item, I'm not pleased at all. I'm getting the picture that when you meet together, it brings out the worst side of you instead of the best. First, I get this report on your divisiveness competing with and criticizing each other. Anybody's toes hurting yet? Mine are. I've just gotten into the second verse. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for what it is is that this testing process will bring truth into the open and confirm it. And then I find that you bring your divisions toward worship, to worship. You come together, and instead of eating the Lord's Supper, you bring a lot of food from the outside and make pigs of yourself. Some are left out and go home hungry. Others have to be carried out, too drunk to walk. None of y'all have ever experienced that, right? I can't believe it, Paul says. Don't you have your own homes to eat and drink in? Why would you stoop to desecrating God's church? Why would you actually shame God's poor? I never would have believed you would stoop to this, Paul says. And I'm not going to stand by and do nothing. 
Hmm. Let me go over with you again, he says, exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the master himself and passed them on to you. The master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, what? This is, this is my body broken for you. Do this and do this to remember me. And after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread and drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. It is. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives, test your heart, come to this meal in holy awe. These are words for us, the people of God, given to us by God himself. Take those in. Say thanks be to God. Right? Thanks that we have these words. So Paul just kind of put it to that church, didn't he? He said he was shocked. He's like, I cannot believe that you would be so blatant to disregard God's table in such a way. Like, I just can't. Did I teach you nothing? Did you hear nothing that I taught you that, I, that, I, that we sat down and we prayed about and you said that you got? He was in shock. I think that he was disappointed that people were talking about each other and criticizing one another and backbiting one another. But the getting drunk in church for us would be like, what? He's like, I can't believe you get drunk in church. Go do that at home. Why are you going to bring all this food in here and gorge? Go do that at home. Do you not see this line of people who are poor, who had to work all day, and all you rich people got to come in here and gorge and defile this this church and this table? And there's people out there who are hungry, who are begging to get in the door just to get to Jesus in this table. What's wrong with you? Come on. We've been reminded of a lot at the table. And I hope that we've learned a lot. We humans are quite interesting. We want it to always be about us. Why is that? I mean, even when we try not to make it about us, we make it about us. I know how you feel, but let me tell you how I feel. It's just in us. It's the human condition. And I think it's funny that we want everything to be about us until it comes to learning something, changing something, or looking at something differently. When it comes to those things, we want it to always be about you. Don't we? So as we prepare, as we prepared for worship, as you had the weekend to prepare for worship, as we took time at the beginning of this service to prepare for worship. I really hope that we are hearing the lessons that God has for you and for me. And the number one thing from this series that I really want us to get, the main ingredient that should always be at our table If you learn nothing else that I teach or preach, I really hope you'll write this down, that you will learn this, that you will internalize this, that you will embody this, that this is what you will live out, okay? The number one ingredient that should always be at our table is what? Love. 
love, not punitive love. See, we don't know what love is. We think it should be punitive love, right? In trouble for everything, getting your knees knocked out for every little thing that you do wrong. Is that what Jesus did? No, not at all, not even to the religious folks. It wasn't a punitive love, not love of judgment, the judgment love, right? The, the judge, the always pointing the finger. How many times has someone said to you, I'm just telling you this because I love you. And they're pointing that finger right in your face and they're just judging you and putting you down and putting you down. It's not that love. Not that I just want what's best for you love either. That's also not the main ingredient. Now, I, you know, we say, I just want the best for you. Now, you know these choices are not good. I just want the best for you. Really, what we're saying to that person is, I don't like what you're doing, and I want you to change, and I want you to love me enough to do it. Jesus never one time loved in that way. People changed. But they changed because of how he loved them without the shame, without the guilt, without the pointing fingers, without the condemnation. So the first ingredient that needs to be at every table is the love like Jesus loved. For me, that was mobile rice. Remember? Remember our little recipes? I hope y'all got your recipe. It's the first one. No matter what else was going on on that table, no matter how awful somebody was, no matter how worthless somebody made somebody else feel, no matter how dysfunctional every family in America is, I think, especially mine was, no matter any of that, when we had mobile rice on my table at Christmas and Thanksgiving, it said, it's going to be okay. And you're okay. That's what it told me. Isn't that weird? That's what it told me. Like, that's what we do when, when Grandma puts... The, the grandchild's favorite out on the table. Are we really ready to say, Lord, I need you to help me get over my grudges and petulant behaviors? Are you ready? I'm holding up a mirror. Am I ready? Are we ready to truly give that mess up to love like Jesus loved? It's the number one main ingredient. The second thing that needs to be at our table is seeking a deeper and more meaningful connection and relationship with Jesus and one another. That's the second thing. That was the second week. This is the hard one. How many people have made our lemon velvet cake with lemon cream cheese icing? Anybody in here? You know what I hear what people say, including myself? Oh, that's got a lot of ingredients. <laughs> I don't have any of that on hand. Yeah, that looks real good. I'll make that later. I'll make that sometime. I think that... Uh, this recipe can be a bit overwhelming, and I think that sometimes we have that take that same kind of thought, if you will, into our relationship with Jesus Christ. It seems so complicated, this relationship with Jesus Christ, something so simple, but it kind of seems so complicated. It's like it's going to take way too much time. It's too hard. There's there's too much that has to go into it. I mean, checking off a box is a whole lot easier than being religious. Remember we talked about that? Took a bite of that lemon, said that's what religion is. It's like, oop, dress nice for church. Oh, check. That's religion. Showed up for church. Check. Stayed after church and talked to three people. Check, check. But this whole relationship business, that's something, that's, that's, that's something weird. Have you ever gone to dinner, like a, let's, just, let's just call it a business dinner, okay? Have you ever gone to a business dinner and you all sit down around the table and you all just sit there like this? 
because you don't know what to do. You don't know the people. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to act. They say something that goes against everything that you believe, and you know you better keep your mouth shut even though you don't want to. Like, you know that tension I'm talking about? That's what we do with God. That's what we do with Jesus. But Jesus says, I have so much love that I'm pouring out to you. When you come to my table, it should be easy. Just come on, plop up like you are. Just be who you are. I'm good. Yeah, relationship can be messy with me, Jesus would say. It can get right, downright dirty at times, right? Because we got to deal with all that messy stuff. That relationship with Jesus makes us look in a mirror. It makes us question our beliefs often. But a relationship with Jesus is the number one most meaningful thing that you will ever do in your entire life. Bar none. Take it from me. Don't go through the aggravation and the hurt and the pain. You know, just if you if you ever gonna learn from somebody who's been there and done that, take it from me. A relationship with Jesus Christ is way better than anything else you can do in your entire life. Because what you do when you don't have that relationship is you're searching for that relationship in everything and in every way that you possibly can, but you will never, ever, ever find it. There is nothing upon nothing that is better than that relationship. That relationship inspires us to be more That relationship calls us to rise up. It challenges us to action in the most holy and profound ways that leaves you speechless and in awe. It's the miracle that we talk about. The third ingredient is that call to action. So... What we like to do is we like to go to the table and stay a while. Have you ever had the guests that come and they sit at the table and they never leave? I I wonder if Jesus feels that way. Like, go on now. Come on. Go do something. No, I just want to stay here. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Look, I'm checking all my boxes, Jesus. (laughs) Jesus is like, I know, but get up. Go see what else I can do. That's like the coolest part of this relationship with God. Like if you, if you love like Jesus and, and we can just get a glimpse of living like Jesus. I don't mean like walking in his footsteps and being perfect. I just mean see how Jesus treated people and go do the same. And you have that in your spirit. You know what begins to happen? This is circular. You know what begins to happen? Is you begin to look at everybody the way Jesus looks at them. With respect. With dignity. With possibility. Imagine that. I have a hard time with that sometimes. I'll be honest, when I am at the stoplight at Providence Road and the key, Ballantyne, and the guys are standing there with their son, do you know what I do? I'm just honest. I'm, it's confession day. i tell you what I do. I turn my head this way. I look down at my phone because I don't know what to do with that. God's still working that out in me. But we take that same attitude toward anyone who is not other, we're missing it. Okay, so I want to tell a story about this. Um, and, and Bob and Sandy, I'm glad you're here today because Bob, you told this story about your mama um, at his mama's funeral this past week. This is the epitome of what I'm talking about, this right here. And I'm going to get the story wrong. But there's this little boy up on 51, and he was chasing his dog. Is that right? And the dog got away from him. Did the dog get hit? 
The dog got hit twice, and the little boy is standing on the side of the road. And he's wailing. He's crying. You can only imagine what that is like. Like half of you are going, oh, my gosh. And as Bob tells the story, it made the papers, all this kind of stuff. And cars, this part, didn't, what I'm about to tell you, didn't make the papers according to Bob. But the fact that he got hit up on 51 made, made the papers. And cars were driving by, just driving by, because they were, they were in a hur hurry. They had somewhere they had to get to. Because, you know, we think only of ourselves. Cars are driving by, driving by, driving by. And here comes Beverly. Miss Beverly. She sees the little boy. She pulls off the side of the road. And she goes. And she sits down on the ground with this little boy who's crying. Until his parents come or until help comes. And she's just with him. And I can guarantee you that Beverly Bell did not say, Boy, what are you doing out here on 51? Don't you know you can get hurt? That's not what she said to him. She put her arm around him. And she said what? Everything is going to be okay. a miracle when Jesus said to those disciples feed my sheep feed my lambs feed my sheep Peter said I will I will I will I promise see the people in Corinth didn't know that they were being such jerks until it was pointed out to them and here's the kicker once they knew they were being jerks and they continued with that, that type of behavior, then they're just jerks. They're choosing to remain to be that way. Being more faithful to themselves was more important than pulling your car off the side of the road and sitting with a little boy and saying, everything's going to be okay. I got one more recipe for you. I'm almost done, I promise. Biscuits. Who can make biscuits in this room? Oh, a trendy. Oh, look, y'all can make biscuits. Somebody needs to teach me how to make biscuits. I can make a great hockey puck. I'm just telling you. So I chose this recipe because regardless of the recipe and the one that you have on this card is the fourth one I tried. <clears throat> Biscuits are hard to make. Biscuits are hard to make. No, 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 no. Let me, let me rephrase that. Good biscuits. Good homemade biscuits are hard to make. It takes practice. It takes determination. Sometimes it takes someone else teaching you how to make biscuits. And I can tell you in my house, it takes gracious spirits to eat the hockey pucks and say, Mmm, this is good. Thank you, Tom Condor. Tommy Condor. But that one time that you get it right, Hallelujah. Right? You get it right. I got them right one time and I was like, you want another biscuit? You want another biscuit? They're so good. Like I got so excited. That one time that you get it right. Oh, man. It's awesome. Here's the thing. At the beginning of the series, I talked about how we look at food as a commodity Right? We just want something to fill our bellies quickly. Don't want to put much thought into it. And some of you right now are saying this. Yeah, I just buy biscuits. They're good enough. And they are. Some of you will go, oh, no, I would never just buy biscuits. I buy the frozen kind. And I bake them, right? They're good, too. <clears throat> or the little can. You know, the can that you open up. Some of those are, are, are good too. But, but 
but it's that attitude of they're good enough. Now, I'm not telling you that we have to cook all of our food homemade and that we have to make biscuits from homemade or we're going straight to H-E, hockey puck, hockey puck, right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's our attitudes about it. I'm saying it's, it's, it's how we think about life and others. I think that, that sometimes because we just want that food so quick and we want to throw it on the table and go our merry way, that that has kind of embodied in us how we look at our faith and how we look at, at one another and how we just want to hurry up and go on to the next thing. It's this attitude of good enough that we take into into our faith. I don't know. But I do know this. Jesus didn't die for us to live that way. Families don't work this way. The body of Christ doesn't hurry up and cast people aside. Jesus died for us to be the example, to be the person that pulls off the side of the road to help a little boy. Jesus died so that we could look at that one person who doesn't look like us, who doesn't have a faith like us, who didn't make choices like us, who isn't married to somebody like us, and we can say to them, there is a place for you right here and the truth be told we don't think that there's a place for us either but there is Jesus sat in that upper room he said do this in remembrance of me guys when you leave here when you get up from this table You are being called to what? Somebody say action. Thank you. This isn't where you stay because there's too much power from me for you to stay here. There's too much for you to do. I've given you too many gifts. There's too many hurting people. There's too many people out there who think that they're worthless. There's too many people out there who think that there's no way that God would ever forgive them. So I want you to get up and go tell people that there's a place for them at the table. And then I want you to get up from the table and I also want you, here's the hard part, you ready? I want you to show them what the table is like. Jesus took, oh, I can't walk over there. Jesus took the cup and he poured it out. And he said, you're going to mess up and it's okay. Jesus said, you're going to get it wrong sometimes and that's okay too. Because you know what? I love you. I love you so much that you will never be able to mess up enough to take that love that I have for you away. You don't have to be skittish when you come to the table. You ever been skittish when you come to the table? You're not sure where to sit. You're not sure whose place you're taking. You're not sure if this is really where you belong. And Jesus is saying you belong. You don't have to be skittish when you come to this table. It is all yours. Can someone say amen? It's the best news you have heard today. It's the best news I have heard today. So in light of COVID, we're going to do communion today. And we're going to do a little different. Okay? I have little cups up here. You see these cups? Okay? And I have little plates with bread on it. As we sing our song, if you're by yourself, you come get a plate and you come get juice. If you're here with someone, 
send one person to come and pick up a plate and however many cups that you need for your family, including children, okay? And then I want you to take that back to your seat and y'all hold it until everybody gets their plates and their cups. And then we will take communion all at one time with the bread and then the juice at the end after that, okay? Does that work? All right, let's pray. Gracious and holy God, you have to pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and the cup that as these folks come fully to this table, as they come in tears, as they come in elation because you have moved, I pray, Lord, that you would offer whatever their need is. If they need acceptance, Lord, that this communion would bring acceptance. If they need to take action and get up from the table, Lord, that they may have the, um, the willpower and that they may have the strength from you to go and, and just like live like you. We give you thanks that we have a table. We give you thanks, God, that we can, we can partake of just this little bite of bread and this little bit of juice and be renewed in a way that is so different from anything else we've ever done. Thank you, Jesus. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing a song. Y'all can sit as we sing. And you all, we've, we've, I think we've got enough. We'll make it work out. So one representative come to the table. Get your bread and get your juice.
with me and Everybody got their bread? Just tear off a little piece. The body of Christ broken for us. Amen. I knew I was going to be the one to spill it, and I didn't. Woohoo. The blood of Christ shed for you. Gracious and holy God, we pray now with once again with that thanksgiving, knowing that this is sustenance for us. That there's spirit here and the little chili bumps we have, we call those Jesus bumps where you're pouring into us. May we have that today. And as we finish this time of worship, may we get up and move away from the table and go into the world and change it, pointing everyone to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We have one more song to sing. It's a hymn. Now let us from this table rise. I want you to pay attention to the words in that song. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 634. Where's Trinity? Oh, there you are.
Well, one thing's for sure. Mistakes and all, Jesus still loves us. <laughs> and maybe that's the message that we take to the world this week. Go in peace. Amen. Go on. Yeah.